<clears throat> the uh, speaker is Professor Fritz uh, Gestesi. I I'm, think I'm mispronouncing that, I apologize. Um, so he's a professor at Baylor University. Uh, he's a foreign fellow of the Norwegian Society of uh, Royal Norwegian Society of Science and Letters and a fellow of the American Mass Society. And he is talking today, whereas your talk is on continuity properties of spectral shift functions of massless Dirac operators in an application to the Witten index. So you probably want to go ahead and share your screen and uh... <clears throat> Thank you very much. Let me see. Can you see this? Yep. Yes. Yes, we can. It's not. How about now? There, there Still it's works. Full screen. That's excellent. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your kind in introduction. And um, let me start by thanking Lajos for his uh, kind invitation. I also want to stress that it's a great honor and in fact, a great pleasure to take part in the 100th anniversary celebrations of ACTA Seged. What you see here is uh, uh, joint work with uh, a fair number of uh, close friends, uh, many from down under. Uh, Roger Nicholas is from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Uh, Jens Kard is from Denmark, but the rest is from uh, Australia. So, this is a talk that uh, is at the interface of spectral theory and uh, operator theory. And uh, I uh, uh, want to start with a fairly extensive motivation. Why are we interested in this spectral shift function? It turns out uh, our main interest lies in uh, trying to understand index theory for a certain class of non fredholm operators and associated with that, the notion of the Witten index. So we'll deal with spectral theory for Schrodinger and Dirac type operators, mostly Dirac type, uh, scattering theory, spectral shift function, and uh, in the course of uh, uh, deriving the main result, we'll look at threshold uh, behavior, or if you want zero energy, uh, resonance behavior and eigenvalue behavior of these massless Dirac operators. Uh, we'll briefly uh, uh, talk about the limiting absorption principle, absolutely continuous spectrum, and at the end, the spectral shift function and its continuity properties. So very quickly, uh, since uh, no one uh, uh, needs much of this, uh, uh, what are fretum operators? What are their main properties? And uh, what can one do if one has something that's uh, perhaps close to a freedom operator, but not quite? Anyway, so uh, from this point on, uh, T is a densely defined closed operator in a Hilbert space. And then the operator T is freedom if its range is closed and its kernel and co-kernel have finite dimension. And if that's the case, then the index, of course, is the difference of these uh, dimensions. I want to point out, because that will be used uh, extensively throughout the talk, kernel of T is, of course, kernel of T star T, and the same with T and T star interchanged, which allows you to uh, employ the notion of self-adjoint non-negative operators, and we will heavily rely on this fact uh, in the rest of the talk. Very quickly, what are the basic facts? Well, of course, the index of... Uh, so T is fragile if and only... Uh, T star is the index of T star is minus the index of T. And perhaps the uh, most interesting criterion when applied to differential operators is that T is freedom if and only if the infimum of the essential spectrum of T star T and T T star is a distance epsilon away from zero. Uh, another a result that's important and that we will uh, we will uh, see in a, in a, in a generalist uh, context is a stability result. So if you add a relatively compact operator S to a freedom operator T, so for instance, if S times the resolvent uh, of T is compact, 
then the index will not change. So the index of T plus S, an additive perturbation equals the index of T. The index stays invariant. And sometimes this is also called topological invariance, especially when you think of uh, differential operators where local changes in the coefficients of the Fredholm PDE operator will, will not change its index. Finally, the famous product formula, uh, index of a product is the sum of the indices, if uh, the product is densely defined. Now, let me change gear and uh, go to a, uh, at the moment, somewhat uh, unrelated object, namely the spectral shift function, which will uh, play a, a critical role in this talk. Let's assume we have two self-adjoint operators, H and H0. Soon enough, they will play the role of T star T and T T star, but at the moment, this is not necessary, so we can look at a, a arbitrary pair of self-adjoint operators. And perhaps the simplest thing about the spectral shift function is to tell you what it can do for you. And it's a remarkable object because uh, one can use it to compute traces of f of h minus f of h zero uh, in terms of the absolutely continuous measure xz d lambda multiplied by the derivative of this function f. Now this uh, needs some assumptions on f of course, and we'll briefly get to that a, a bit later. But for instance, if you're bounded from below and uh, if h and h zero were t star t and t t star, then we are bounded from below even by zero. The, and if the semigroup difference is trace class, then uh, this allows you to compute the trace of the semigroup difference in uh, terms of the right-hand side. Similarly, uh, if the resolvent difference is trace class, you get an analogous formula in that case. And let me just mention in the situation, this is a very simple situation and there are lots of generalizations and we will look at one of them at the end of this talk. If for instance, H minus H zero is relatively compact with respect to H zero, then C is given in terms of the arguments so in log of uh, normal or non-tangential limits of this uh, Fredholm determinant where the spectral parameter uh, goes towards the real axis. So this formula works well in the ODE case, but does not work for the PDE case. And we will have to uh, look at generalizations, uh, as I just said at the end of this talk. So um, let me introduce now an object that uh, will help to uh, the, uh, compute the, the Witten index of uh, a class of operators. Uh, it's uh, given in terms of, it's a semi-group regularized Witten index. There's this little s as a subscript. And what you do is you take the difference. So for a uh, operator T that again is uh, densely defined uh, and closed, you take uh, the semi-group uh, difference of T star T and T T star and uh, take the limit as T goes to infinity whenever this limit exists. So in particular, whenever the difference here is trace class and the limit exists. One can show that uh, if uh, the spectral shift function for this pair, so H and H zero are now uh, replaced by uh, T star T and T T star, if this spectral function is continuous from above, uh, so from the right at zero, then this limit exists and equals the spectral shift function at zero from the right. In fact, the more sophisticated approach shows that uh, you don't need continuity from above, but you would need that uh, zero is a right and left, the back point of this uh, spectral shift function. Also, I should mention that whenever we have uh, boundedness from below, and I do this more generally here for H and H zero again, then uh, below the common lower bound, we will always normalize the spectral shift function to be zero. That's because the spectral shift function is unique up to additive constants. And so this is a way to fix that constant. And we will do that in the, in the following. Let me uh, recall a, a consistency uh, result uh, between uh, this uh, semi-group regularized Witten index or the resolvent regularized Witten index and the Fredholm index. So suppose this difference is trace class. So the semi-group difference is trace class and suppose T is Fredholm, then one can show that the limit I just showed you exists. 
And in fact, the Fredholm index equals this uh, semi-group regularized Witten index and equals the spectral shift function from the right at zero for the pair T star T as the unperturbed operator, if you want, and T T star as the perturbed operator. Let me uh, emphasize that in general, this Witten index is not integer valued. So there is a uh, celebrated uh, two-dimensional magnetic field system that one can analyze in this context. And for this magnetic field system, the semi-group regularized Witten index has the meaning of magnetic flux. This flux is not quantized, so it can be any real number. However, you still have a stability result, as we just uh, mentioned a uh, few minutes ago in, the, in connection with relative compactness. And so one can show, this has been done a while ago, that uh, the semigroup or the resolvent regularized Witten index is stable under additive perturbations, but not under relatively compact perturbations. They have to be relatively trace class. So under a stronger hypothesis, you still have this notion of uh, topological invariance. In other words, local changes of the coefficients of PDE or ODE freedom operators, or in this case, non uh, freedom operators, but for which the Witten index exists, will not change the Witten index. Now, uh, it's um, not quite, uh, so the operators that we want to discuss and for which we want to co to, uh, to get formulas for the Witten index is actually not quite uh, the ones I have shown you so far. They are of this form where bold phase objects indicate direct integrals over families of operators. So in, in this particular case, A and uh, B will be defined on the next page. They are uh, of the form DDT plus A. A is a direct integral and uh, A minus will be an asymptote. It in fact will not depend on T as you will see on the next page, whereas B uh, of T will be a family depending on T. So um, let me indicate on, uh, quickly what A, the asymptotes A plus minus and what B uh, are. The underlying Hilbert space here is uh, the one coming from a direct integral as, as you will see. So. Uh, once again, here's the direct integral. The fibers here are constant, actually. So this could be H of T, but it's not. For us, it's a fixed Hilbert space H. The uh, operators depend on T. And so here is uh, A minus one of the asymptotes will be the free massless Dirac operator. And A plus will be the interacting uh, massless Dirac operator, where the interaction is given in terms of this asymptote B plus or V and B of T. So that's where the T dependence in A of T comes from, is uh, uh, turning on uh, B plus. You see B goes uh, to zero as T goes to minus infinity, but goes to plus one in a smooth manner as T goes to uh, plus infinity. So that's why A minus and A plus are the asymptotes of A of T in the norm resolvent sense. So what one can show is, and now I'm going back to T star T and T T star, but in the form that T is now this operator D A and uh, T star D A star. So for this class of operators that uh, we will define in terms of uh, these massless Dirac operators, uh, the Witten index, the semi, group regularized Witten index will be either the uh, right Lebesgue point, this is what the L means here, of this pair of the uh, spectral shift function for the pair H2 and H1, or internally, you can also express it as the arithmetic mean of uh, left and right limit of uh, the spectral shift function for these massless Dirac type operators. Uh, once again, um, the, one of the classical uh, examples of uh, non fredholm operators would be Dirac operators without a mass gap, so massless Dirac operators, and that's why we are interested in, in, in them. And uh, you see this formula here, of course, explains our interest in the properties, continuity properties in particular, of spectral shift functions for massless 
their archetype operators. So now this is uh, the introductory part, and I will from now on focus exclusively on uh, the archetype operators, usually massless ones, and only a few times I will compare with the ma massive case. So the hypotheses are little n is the, the space dimension of our Dirac operator. This is the massless uh, free, so no interaction uh, Dirac operator. Alpha here are um, Clifford, algebra, uh, Clifford matrices. They are of dimension capital N times N, where N is given here in terms of two to the uh, N plus one over two, the floor function. So uh, the uh, uh, smallest integer less or equal to N plus one over two. Uh, Clifford matrices are self-adjoint. They satisfy the, the usual uh, anti-commutation relation. So if J is uh, different from K, you get zero on the right-hand side. If J equals K, the square of them is uh, the identity matrix, uh, IN. And uh, the domain, of course, of such a uh, free massless Dirac operator would be the Sobolev space uh, W12, but uh, capital N components because of these N by N matrices alpha J. Now, uh, in order to introduce an interactive uh, massless Dirac operator H, we will add a potential matrix. So we take it N by N, capital N by N. And at the moment, we want a certain decay at infinity. So you see that uh, it decays faster than uh, a Coulomb potential at infinity. Uh, this is a fairly general assumption. And so electromagnetic fields are definitely included. What one can show uh, for under these assumptions on, on, uh, on the potential V, both H0 and H have essential spectrum, uh, the whole real line. In fact, for H0, the essential spectrum is, is also absolutely continuous and uh, is the entire spectrum. Uh, the fact that V is relatively compact allows you to conclude that also uh, the essential spectrum of H, so of the interacting massless Dirac operator is the entire real line. So these are non fredholm operators. Uh, in the free case, one of course knows everything because by a Fourier transform, H0 becomes a, a, a matrix valued multiplication operator. And uh, let me just for a moment compare with the uh, massive case. So when you have the massive case, you have one more Clifford matrix, which is typically called beta. So you add that to H0. And uh, in this case, you open a spectral gap from minus M to plus M if uh, the mass parameter M is assumed to be strictly positive. Uh, the relation, of course, to uh, the Laplacian is that when you square this uh, H0 of M, so the massive free one, you get the Laplacian plus M squared. So this, of course, is also valid when M is equal to zero in the mass less case. So what you see here is that when M goes to zero, this gap is closing. That's why we get uh, results like this uh, or this. However, there is still some interesting happening at zero. Uh, the reason why zero is uh, a, a special point, particular point, is because the potential matrix V uh, decays at infinity, goes to zero. So zero is still a strange point and it is not obvious, maybe I stay here for a moment, it is not obvious that uh, the spectral properties of H will be similar to the spectral properties of H0 in the sense that you will not have singular continuous spectrum and uh, uh, you might uh, not have embedded eigenvalues in the uh, essential spectrum. In fact, what one cannot rule out for H is that it has zero energy eigenvalues. So this is different from H0, of course, and we will take a closer look at that in the course of this, uh, this talk. So uh, let me go back to the uh, massive case, uh, massless case, so M equals zero, uh, and, and remind uh, everyone that the Green's function in this case can be explicitly uh, written down in terms of Hunkel 
functions multiplied by appropriate matrices. So either the Clifford matrices are for one, here alpha one to alpha n, not no beta here, there's no mass, and here the identity matrix, the n by n identity matrix. Uh, what is uh, remarkable in particular is that the energy zero limit of this Green's function exists and you get uh, an object uh, of this type. This will play a role later on when we talk, talk about Ries uh, integrals uh, and related topics. I should say that this is in sharp contrast to the massive case because for the massive case, uh, you have blow up when the energy parameter, the complex energy parameter goes to zero. Not so in the massless case. So uh, let me uh, return to uh, the spectrum of H, the interacting massless Dirac operator. So we know that uh, the essential spectrum is the real line. Uh, we know everything about the spectrum of H zero. And so uh, you could ask, what could possibly go wrong with the spectrum of H? And uh, as I just uh, mentioned a little earlier, one could still have embedded eigenvalues. One could in fact have singular continuous spectrum. And it will take uh, a few efforts uh, using a limiting absorption principle and uh, related uh, topics to eventually show that also the absolutely continuous spectrum of H is the real line. The singular continuous spectrum is actually absent. And in fact, all that can happen is that uh, you have uh, eigenvalues sitting at zero or no eigenvalues at all, but uh, it will be a, a longer path towards that goal. So let me uh, uh, do the following now. Uh, the, uh, I'm strengthening my hypothesis. So for the essential spectrum, I only needed decay a little faster than Coulomb, so minus one minus epsilon. But for what, what's coming now, I will need a little more. And so I'm increasing now the decay of uh, the potential matrix or its elements to uh, minus two, mod x minus two at infinity. I will also use a polar decomposition of this uh, n times n uh, matrix. And I'll, uh, I'll do it in the, in the usual way that uh, we, uh, I use a, actually it's not quite the usual way, I use a symmetrized polar decomposition where mod V one half and uh, uh, mod V is uh, uh, the usual in terms of the spectral theorem is on the left and right and the uh, partial isometry is sitting in the middle. This is a typical quadratic form assumption and uh, frequently done in uh, matrix uh, valued contexts. So let me uh, talk a little about what can happen at uh, zero energy for our Dirac massless uh, Dirac type operator. So the one possibility is that uh, zero is simply an eigenvalue. So in other words, you have uh, a function psi that's a distributional solution of h psi equals zero, but at the same time, it lies in the domain of h, so in the w12 space. In other words, the null space of h is non-trivial. There is another possibility. You could have what is called a zero energy or threshold resonance of h. In this case, you have what's called um, an eigenvalue minus one of a biermann schwinger type operator. You see what I'm doing here? I'm taking the free, the massless resolvent. I take the limit to zero energy from say a, a, a normal limit from the upper complex half plane. And I take half the potential on the left and half the potential on the right. So once again, this was uh, the polar decomposition of our matrix potential V. So you have them uh, on either side. And uh, if this kernel, if this null space is non-trivial, we are in the situation of a zero energy resonance. Uh, uh, the point is that uh, uh, you again have a distributional solution psi of H psi equals zero, but it will not lie in the domain of the operator. Otherwise it would be an eigenvalue. 
However, what will lie in uh, the L2, underlying L2 space is the function uh, phi that uh, you get from, uh, from uh, this connection here. So there is a Riesz-type integral, there is part of the potential, half of the potential if you want, and the function phi, uh, which is uh, uh, in, the, in the null space of this uh, Biermann, uh, in, uh, sorry, in, in the null space of one plus the uh, Biermann Schwinger operator. Uh, finally, uh, the simplest situation, of course, and in many ways the generic situation is that nothing happens at zero. So it's a, what we call a regular point. So it's neither a zero energy eigenvalue nor a zero energy resonance of H. So generically, this is of course the, the situation. But these situations can exist and have to be taken into account uh, in the following. So here is uh, <clears throat> a little result that uh, was proved uh, uh, in collaboration with Roger Nichols. Uh, in, one needs to distinguish space dimensions. So two dimensions for these massless Dirac operators are very different from higher dimensional ones. In the uh, two dimensional case, you have actually four possibilities. So either you are regular, nothing happens at zero. No eigenvalue, no resonance at zero. You could also have, so this is case two, a possibly twice degenerate resonance at zero energy. In this case, the uh, resonance function psi, so the distributional solution of H psi being zero is uh, in LQ, but Q is not two, because if Q were two, it would be uh, an eigenvalue. The gradient in fact is L2, and uh, uh, we call this as before a uh, resonance, a zero energy resonance of H. Finally, of course, there's the possibility you could have an eigenvalue. In this case, the uh, distributional solution of H psi being zero is in uh, your domain of the operator. So in particular, it's in L2. Uh, and in fact, one can show under these uh, conditions that we had on the potential with this decay of mod x to the minus two at infinity, that it's even in L Q when Q uh, runs through this range. Finally, the worst case scenario, you can have a possible mixture of two and three. So you could have a zero energy resonance and you could have a zero energy eigenvalues. Now, let me turn to other dimensions, dimension larger than three. Well, Surprisingly, there are only two possible cases. There is no possibility of a zero energy resonance in higher dimensions, strictly higher than two dimensions. So from three on, you either are regular or you have a possibility to generate eigenvalue at H. The eigenvalue is still possible, but there are no zero energy resonances in dimensions larger or equal to three. Uh, finally, uh, the point is regular when uh, this Biermann Schwinger operator has a trivial kernel. So this is another, uh, another point we want to make here. Let me say that this is quite different uh, uh, when one compares with massive Dirac operators, because then you get no threshold resonances at uh, dimension, from dimensions five and higher on, but not before. Whereas in our case, this already happens with dimensions three. So there's quite a difference between massive and massless Dirac operators. The same, by the way, happens with Schrodinger operators. Also the uh, dividing line is dimension five and not two as it is in this massless uh, Dirac operator situation. So uh, if you wonder, uh, maybe I go back one more time. If you wonder why the difference between uh, two and three, or in this case five and and and, uh, and, and, and less dimensions, the uh, reason is that psi behaves a bit like the Green's function, and it's the asymptotic decay at infinity that uh, immediately gives you an L two solution if you have a solution, and so that's why from three dimensions on in the massless case or from five dimensions on in the massive Dirac operator case or Schrodinger operator case, you no longer have 
threshold resonances, the uh, corresponding solutions of H psi equals zero decay so fast at infinity that they are automatically L2. And in fact, their gradient is in L2 as well. All right, so uh, Reese type integrals, I mentioned that a little earlier, play a role in this context. So uh, in other words, the uh, uh, fractional Laplacian uh, enters, the, in, enters uh, the usual estimates for this uh, Reese type integrals from uh, uh, mapping LP into LQ with a very fixed uh, uh, relationship between P and Q is used to prove results like that. And also uh, a, a beautiful uh, identity uh, for these Reese kernels and estimates uh, of uh, similar objects and uh, the proof of the result I just uh, mentioned. Now, uh, moving on to uh, the uh, spectral properties of this uh, massless Dirac operator H. So we already knew from the very beginning that the essential spectrum was the real line. And uh, under the current hypothesis, uh, we have the following that uh, we can show using uh, a, uh, the, the, the theory of strongly locally Cato smooth operators that the essential, uh, that the singular continuous spectrum of H indeed is empty, that the singular uh, spectrum uh, is uh, a point spectrum. So there are eigenvalues only. And uh, at the moment they can at most accumulate at plus minus infinity and at zero. Eventually we will rule, we'll be able to rule this out. So uh, uh, we will, uh, uh, the only thing that cannot be ruled out at the end is that zero uh, is possibly an eigenvalue of the uh, massless Dirac operator H. But at the moment, uh, we are not there yet. I want to say that uh, again, the uh, eigenvalues of, uh, of uh, so the singular spectrum of H comes with eigenvalues minus one of this uh, Biermann Schwinger type operator, where in the middle you have the free massless resolvent uh, and uh, on uh, on left and right you have uh, um, half the interaction potential so v1 and v2 come from the polar decomposition of the matrix v and uh, uh, one can also show that uh, the uh, uh, there is some properties of these limits when uh, uh, you take a non-tangential or normal limits uh, to the to the real axis. Uh, the wave operators, the global wave operators, exist. This, of course, is related with the absence of uh, a singular continuous spectrum, and one has, in fact, that the kernel of these wave operators is trivial, and the range is the entire absolutely continuous spectral subspace of H. So now I'm going to uh, make uh, additional assumptions to get rid of all these possible eigenvalues that accumulate at zero or at plus minus infinity. So I will look at two particular assumptions. Uh, assumption A here is uh, a little more about the radial derivative of the matrix elements of, of V. We are making a C1 uh, assumption here uh, outside the ball, a large enough ball. But in, uh, uh, in uh, part B, we are also making, in addition to, uh, to the assumption A, we will make uh, a smallness assumption of V. So you see the operator norm of V multiplied by mod X is supposed to be in a certain interval. So that's a smallness assumption of V. And under this uh, hypothesis, one can uh, show the following. So first of all, when you assume, uh, in addition to what we had before, uh, hypothesis A, then the point spectrum can only lie at zero. So now we got rid of all the embedded eigenvalues except at zero. And uh, finally, if you make the smallness assumption in addition, so as assumption B, one can actually show that the norm of that biermann schwinger operator is strictly less than one, and so it cannot have an eigenvalue minus one, and therefore there is never a zero energy uh, eigenvalue either. And so the entire uh, point spectrum is empty. 
In this case, by the way, H and H0 are unitarily equivalent. They both have the same spectrum, but in fact, they are unitarily equivalent, and the unitary equivalence is given in terms of those uh, wave operators that I mentioned uh, a little before. I should say that uh, this result that I'm uh, quoting here is relatively recent. So you see this goes back to 2015. Uh, before that, results of this type uh, are not known, at least not known to me. So uh, in order to uh, uh, say something about the spectral shift function in, uh, for the pair H and H0, let me go back to uh, uh, a more uh, abstract version at first. So eventually A and B will be H0 and H, where those are the two uh, massless Dirac operators, but we don't need to do this now. And so let me uh, recall a uh, celebrated result by uh, Mark Krein, which uh, uh, states the following, if the difference of resolvents is trace class, then uh, the uh, spectral shift function for that pair of self-adjoint operators, so A and B here are self-adjoint, uh, is a locally integrable function. In fact, if you uh, use a weighted, uh, 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 a weight of the form one over one plus lambda squared, uh, it's actually integrable and uh, the trace can be computed in terms of the derivative of the resolvent function. You see the lambda minus c squared here. Uh, one can ask, so uh, for which other functions will this work? It turns out uh, this is an interesting and um, highly non-trivial question uh, that uh, Vladimir Bella has uh, analyzed in detail. And uh, the actual functions that are admissible here, not just the resolvent function, uh, uh, are related to certain base of uh, spaces. Now, I should say that while this is a great result for ODE uh, operators and applications, this does not work in uh, the context of PDE operators. So the difference of resolvents simply is not, uh, not trace class. So one needs to uh, go further. Uh, before I do that, let me just mention two more things. So the spectral shift function in a essential spectral gap. So you see you have an interval delta whose closure has no uh, intersection with the essential spectrum. So it's an essential spectral gap. In this case, uh, uh, the difference of C, uh, the upper limit and uh, the lower limit of the interval is actually a, a difference of eigenvalue counting functions. So for the discrete spectrum, if you want, we are counting eigenvalue differences. And for the uh, uh, absolutely continuous spectrum, so quite the opposite uh, in this context, uh, it turns out that uh, the uh, fixed energy scattering matrix is trace class and it's, uh, uh, is, is, is a, sorry, is of the form one plus trace class and it's uh, freedom determinant or the logarithm thereof is up to a multiple uh, given by this spectral shift function. So you see, it's, it's what a physicist would call the phase shift for the scattering spectrum, and it is an eigenvalue counting function for discrete spectrum. So here is uh, a quick uh, look at uh, the uh, founders of this subject. So Lifshitz was a, a very well-known theoretical physicist who introduced the spectral shift function around 1952 for uh, finite rank perturbations of a fixed self-adjoint operator. And uh, Mark Krein, uh, uh, in a period from 53 to 63, uh, developed uh, the theory that I, I just showed you. I also want to mention a result that now is already applicable to uh, uh, Dirac operators and massless Dirac operators to some degree. So here one doesn't look at differences of resolvents, but powers of resolvents. And uh, at least uh, for odd powers, Dima uh, uh, Yafayev, proved uh, the anal analogous formula. So first of all, 
he showed that when you weigh with the appropriate uh, uh, weight, so you divide by one plus mod lambda to the m plus one, then uh, this function C is integrable. And uh, the trace of a uh, resolvent power difference of this form is then given again by that what one expects from the derivative of this function. So you see the m plus one uh, and the one over lambda minus C here. So uh, that uh, is, is a special result uh, from 2005. We need a little more than that. So I uh, should also say that there's the same uh, condition here, that the, uh, when you are dealing with multidimensional Dirac type operators, the M will depend on uh, the space dimension. So the larger the space dimension, the larger uh, M one has to choose. Anyway, so I want to introduce a hypothesis that when M is on, odd is basically what we just saw in uh, uh, the context of year five uh, result, but I need an extra condition of uh, B minus A need to be relative uh, trace, need to lie in a relative uh, trace ideal situation if you want. So the B minus A times the resolvent of A, A plays the role of the unperturbed operator, B plays the role of a perturbed operator. So H zero later and H again for the Dirac type operators, but B minus A times the uh, powers of uh, the uh, uh, unperturbed resolvent should lie in uh, uh, Schatten von Neumann ide uh, ideals of uh, order M plus one divided by J. J here runs between one and m plus one when m is of course the integer here. Now in the case when m is even, we need one more assumption. So another trace class type assumption. So, but here you see you have a squared now. So this is a, a little less stringent than uh, some of uh, the conditions one has seen before. Now I need to introduce two functions. One is uh, since only powers of resolvent differences are trace class, I need modified phratom determinants, not the usual phratom determinant. So this is the notation that m plus one, m the integer that we just saw in uh, this condition here. And uh, uh, so this is one object I need. The second one is I give it in terms of derivatives. So there will be some polynomials when we uh, go after G itself. So th that's a function f the logarithm of this modified phratom determinant and the function g that uh, is given in terms of sums and derivatives of such combinations of a and b of z, where b of z is this family that we just saw in uh, the condition here. So b uh, minus a, uh, oops, and uh, we, need, uh, we need this con combination to, uh, to and, and powers thereof in, under the sum here. All right, uh, if one introduces these objects, there's a relation between them. So the F, the logarithm of the modified phratom determinant can be expressed in terms of G, in terms of an integral over the speckle shift function for the self adjoint pair A and B. And because of the derivatives here, uh, in terms of a polynomial of degree at most M minus one. And with that, uh, one can uh, show that uh, the spectral shift function now is also given as the uh, normal or non-tangential limit of now, not a Fredholm determinant, but the modified Fredholm determinant. And there are additional uh, 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 limits to the, to the real axis of the function G that we just introduced and the polynomial uh, shows up as well. So uh, uh, given that, we uh, look at uh, a, a new set of hypotheses, a more, uh, more decayed infinity. So uh, we had already Coulomb plus epsilon, then we had minus two, but now we need minus n. So the space dimension enters the situation here, minus one minus epsilon. And uh, under this, uh, assumptions, you can guarantee the existence of the spectral shift function as I just discussed it. In addition, we will assume this condition A. You remember we had condition A and B. For under, under both, we had no eigenvalues whatsoever, but under condition A, zero was the only 
possible eigenvalue. And so uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, we will assume. So the decay uh, is now space dimension dependent, and we will still make this assumption uh, from the paper by Carf uh, and company. And uh, with all that, we can get to the uh, final result. So under this uh, hypothesis uh, on the previous page, one has indeed the existence of Xi. It's a continuous function away from the origin. But the behavior at the origin is tame. So the limits left and right uh, do exist. So in particular, uh, the Witten index, if you remember the introduction is applicable in this context. And that's uh, why we got uh, interested in this topic. I should also say that uh, if zero is a regular point, so if uh, there is no zero energy eigenvalue, no zero energy resonance, then C is a continuous function under the hypothesis that we just saw. So the uh, proof of that result is, uh, is a long story. Uh, relies on a barrage of trace norm estimates uh, and then this to do uh, to show the uh, representation of xi in terms of these non-tangential boundary values of these functions f and g uh, underlying uh, of course with this modified regularized freedom determinant and so very quickly uh, uh, what this is based on so uh, uh, there, are, there is a 2018 paper in which we discuss the global limiting absorption principle. There is this paper with Roger Nichols where we discuss the uh, threshold situation of massless Dirac operators. Actually, in that paper, we also discussed the massive case and we review the situation for Schrodinger operators. But uh, the last result I just showed you is uh, based on a, uh, on a long manuscript that uh, we finished last year that's still under review. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much. <coughs>